everyone to another in our series of Transforming Assessment, and this one is uh, publicly co-badged with eAssessment Scotland. So welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's one of the nice things about having these webinars is people can be here from all over the world. And uh, certainly that's one of the things we've been trying to do as part of the eAssessment Scotland and also Transforming Assessment, is to be inclusive of uh, people around the world who can't be physically at a particular event. Uh, so today we're very happy to have Will Rifkin, Associate Professor Will Rifkin from the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia. Uh, Will is well known uh, for actually being very entrepreneurial, I think, Will, we could say, in uh, education. Will describes himself as an engineer who's turned into a sociologist. Uh, many of you may know of Will's work in sort of new media for science education. Uh, he's done quite a bit of work there. He'll be talking obviously a bit about his new media for science wiki. Uh, and we'll put the URL for that up later. For the SAMNET, uh, here in Australia many of us know the work that Will's involved in as part of a major networking group here in Australia around science and mathematics education. And uh, Will will probably talk about that as well. Uh, I've been to a number of workshops and sessions that Will has uh, run about using media in science education and Will will remember that probably the first time we had a face-to-face -face session was at a conference where Will got us all to use our iPhones to uh, make some little videos around an educational topic and so we're putting the groups as part of that workshop and I had a huge amount of fun uh, doing that, but it was a really good hands-on experience of how you can use new media in education. So Will, Will's uh, presentation is entitled Old School New Media, Developing Communication Ability in a Digital Age. So Will, I'll hand over to you to start the session. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction, Jeff. Uh, what I'm looking to do now is how do I bring up my first slide? Uh, you should see at the top there's a little arrows next to the word welcome. There, there we go. Okay, there yep, you got go. it. Okay, good, good, good. Um, the first thing I'll do is I'll ask you all a uh, question and we'll see if the voting function works. And if not, Todd, if you can write in the chat space, how many of you already assigned students to make a video or a podcast, a blog or a wiki or something like that? The numbers are accumulating. Okay, so I'd say what about a, a third of you are already experts, and and half of you haven't done it yet. Okay, I think we're almost 50/50, more than 50/50, seven to three. Okay, very good. Okay, well the title is. Uh, Picking up on the idea of old skill new media, how, as you know, when you make one reason you may be experimenting is that you see the obvious educational benefits of having students create assignments using, you know, making a video about a topic or collectively making a wiki. And the notion, I guess, for a lot of you, since you may already be on board, is how do we make it a case to others that students are actually learning both uh, subject content mm -hmm. as well as that quote unquote graduate attributes about communication, critical thinking, teamwork, and that sort of thing. So the subtitle here is Developing Communication Ability in a Digital Age. And related to that is also almost a philosophical question or an ethical question. Are we really doing our jobs if we're not assigning students to create something in new media? That is, if they're going to present themselves or their cause or their organization online, if they're going to present themselves online, well, they are presenting themselves online. Can we, you know, still have them working solely on paper? Okay. So the outline for my slides today uh, is going to be discussing one example briefly, uh, looking at what some of the challenges may be in the minds of our colleagues about whether or not to give students these kinds of assignments. Uh, directing you to an assignment some of my own students created, an animation on geoengineering, which I've got, you know, a lot of nice creativity and some very good scripting. And then trying to place this work in the context of what's going on in the academic sector. What percentage of lecturers are actually assigning their students to create new media assignments? And then discussing about the shift or the threshold concepts that might be involved in assigning students to create something for an audience that could go certainly beyond the instructor and very well 
very likely be on the classroom. And introducing an acronym that's uh, hard to remember, SGMMC, for Student Generated Multimedia Content, discussing the possibilities for that. And then looking at results of some interviews that we've had, about 20 interviews in depth, ranging from 30 minutes to an hour and a half of lecturers saying, how are you using information and communication technology in your teaching, your administration, and your research? To again look at the, what might be some of the threshold concepts involved and some of the shifts involved in order to get people to uh, assign, give their students these kinds of assignments. And along the way, I know when a speaker says, ask questions whenever you have them, I'm happy to be interrupted. That usually means they don't take a breath for the next 45 minutes. So I will pause periodically and keep myself very quiet and ask for questions. So what questions do you have at this point? If anyone would like to ask a question uh, using the microphone, if you just want to put your hand up, uh, that is the little symbol there, like Matthew has uh, done it, a hand symbol, and then we'll know. Otherwise, you can just type into the text box as well, and we can uh, look in there and respond to the questions there. So uh, please go ahead. So I can see uh, Brad's probably typing something in there. Uh, so that's the other thing. If you look at the, at the names of the people, you can actually tell when someone's uh, typing something in. Okay. Okay, good. All right, on to the next slide. An example uh, I'm going to give is something that I began uh, looking at that slide way back in 2003. That's nearly 10 years ago, uh, the Worldwide Day in Science that some of you may be familiar with where I assigned students in our class on graduate attributes and science uh, for students who were in their second year. It's actually a, a half a subject, and I'd done half a subject with them in the previous semester. They were to interview a scientist or a science-based professional about their career and how they got into it, and to publish their stories online as a career guide for high school students. So I determined that having an actual website that you know, people outside the class could view made the assessment an authentic assignment. Uh, the students formed, in the, the initial years, the students formed into teams. They had to create their own website, which meant they needed a few web developers. And in a class of 80, you'd certainly have one or two who knew how to make a website. There were a couple of leaders for the project. There were team managers. There were reporters, producers, and editors. And so it simulated an organization, and it had a real product. And through that experiment, I saw how easy this was, even though I didn't know how to make a website myself. And uh, it was one of the easiest classes I ever taught. I only met any one student in a hand two or three times during a semester, but I meet with different groups of students in different weeks. And so building on that, I got together with some colleagues who also were running science communication degree programs. And we decided to use this as a focus for a funded project, a grant proposal, to look at in what ways could these kinds of assignments boost the communication abilities of undergraduates in science, I mean, studying university science, and use their critical thinking, their teamwork, and their um, insights into ethics, such as copyright and that sort of thing. Uh, Will, there's a couple of uh, comments in the uh, text box. Okay. So I was just wondering whether you had seen those. Uh, so Jackie's okay. put in a comment there. Okay. Did it generate ideas to attract female students to science? Yes, there were some of the role models whom the students have portrayed over the eight years the assignment ran. A lot of the students in the class were women, and a lot of them sought women as role models to portray them on the website. The, you know, the, the studies have shown, there's a study from the University of New England that suggested the two greatest influences on students' career choices were their high school teachers and whether or not they could envision themselves in a career in science. And so what this, um, this particular assignment was doing, what it was, it was asking the students themselves, the uni students, to find people you know, who were role models. And one of the questions I asked was, uh, what got you interested when you were our age or when you were younger? And in addition, in the later years, the last three or four years, we had a personality test 
It was based on the Myers-Briggs test and the Gardner Intelligences test. It was reduced to five questions, asking things like, would you rather be tromping through the jungle with a film crew or having dinner with a Nobel Prize winner? And each of the people interviewed completed this profile, and then when the high school students came to visit the site, they would complete the same profile and it would pick out the scientists or science-based professionals who had given the same answers. So it would show that somebody like them had gone into a career like science. So yes, there were some, there was some material that would inter interest female students, but uh, strategies specifically, um, the strategy of the whole assignment was meant uh, to be that sort of thing. So back to the slide, as you'll see, uni student product for high school students. In a recent year, there were a million hits, which meant about 20,000 visitors who visited for more than 30 seconds. We aligned the assignment with the New South Wales science syllabus for years 9 and 10 to fit it in with what teachers would be doing in the classroom. So we didn't wait for people to wander across the site or to find it by searching. We said we inserted it in the syllabus. Students in high school would address it as an assignment. So what was the uptake? So we generated additional, you know, an, we thought we had an audience. We thought we had selected an audience. And we came up with an assignment that could be shared. And it was picked up by universities in Uruguay, Scotland, uh, United Arab Emirates, and I may be missing a country or two. The big challenge in making it a really worldwide assignment was there isn't really much of a tradition of sharing assignments in science particularly assignments focused on communication or graduate attributes. In the high school audience, getting the viewers, I was told high school science teachers get flyers every week or every day about different things they can expose their students to. So it's competing for their attention. And the assignment also illustrated the advantages and challenges of using these sorts of online products is that you're adding stakeholders. And each new stakeholder has to be attended to. Whereas if you're just creating an assignment for your students to hand to you, you're the only stakeholder they're interested in. Although you may be interested in preparing them for professional work, people in the world of employment are not involved. Whereas in addition, we involve the people the students were interviewing. So there are opportunities and challenges. So in terms of giving you a big picture perspective on what's going on in Australia and elsewhere, instead of talking about what everyone's doing, I'm going to look at things kind of intrinsically. If we take a sample of people who are in science but not in other disciplines, science being traditionally a more conservative area when it comes to teaching, and looking at how those who have self-selected to say they're interested in these kinds of assignments, how have they responded to this initiative? So we've had two years of funding from the Australian Learning and Teaching Council looking at assignments for students in science where they would create new media. An example would be a short video created by teams of students in a first year biology subject as has been done at the University of Queensland. And the notion is to pick up on, this is now, I'm forgetting the guy's name now, Roy Sadler's idea, assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. You, you give students points for doing something you know they will learn from doing rather than just waiting, giving them the task to see what, they, what they've learned already. So an example we've got that you could look at, you could Google and maybe open it in, a, in another window, is a short video animation on geoengineering. That is how scientists could shoot umbrellas into space to protect the Earth from global warming and a variety of other strategies. So would those points be considered a rating of participation? I'm not sure. Which point, Brent, I'm not sure which points you're talking about. Points along the way to doing the actual assignment. I'm still not sure what points you're talking about. No, the, you gave students, I was assigning the students, uh, the website was part of their mark, 
which 80 students in the class shared a mark for the website. That mark was moderated by the assessment they were given by members of their project team, like they might be creating a, a story on um, a psychologist or a story on a park ranger. So if they pulled their weight in their team and they did other things and they seemed to learn, their teammates voted that they deserved more points, their mark would go up or down. They also created a reflective essay on what they had learned in this process of engaging in this assignment, and they created an essay on how they would be using what they'd learned in this subject in a future career in science. And there were bullet points they had to attend to in each essay. So I wasn't testing them along the way. All three assignments were submitted at the end of the semester. So they were engaging in this process to learn through, the, learn through creating a website, learn through the reflection, and learn through assessing their classmates' contributions, because they also had to assess their own contribution to the teamwork. All right. And if you visit the Day in Science website and you go to the early years, you'll see the students' descriptions of their engagement with the assignments themselves. Okay. So if, you're, if you've assigned students to make a video or you've not assigned students to make anything online, are you behind? You're probably, let's see, you're perhaps behind your students who are playing on Facebook and using that for a lot of their communication. You're probably not behind other academics. And here's my rationale behind that, is that in our new Media for Science project every two years, we had roughly 30 workshops and conference sessions. And through those sessions, about 200 science academics self-identified as saying, we are interested in these kinds of assignments. So if you consider that there are 40,000 university academics in Australia, and one-tenth of them, roughly, would be seen as in science. If you have 10 faculty at the university, one would be a science faculty. Of those 200, uh, of those 4,000 science academics, 200 said they were interested. That's about 5%. So we may have missed people. There may have been people who were interested who didn't come to our session. But of those who came, we're saying 5% are interested. But even of those interested enough to come to the session, only 30 science academics were providing new media assignments. So less than 1%, fewer than 1% of science academics are actually providing these kinds of assignments. So if you look at the S-curve of adoption, we're way off at the left side. Only the first few innovators are getting involved at this point. So you're not behind. But if you look at the context in which academics work, where many of them use PowerPoint, email, they get listserv messages, they use a learning management system at their uni, they have a web page for their school or department, a website for the research group, they may be involved in Skype teleconferences, they could be on LinkedIn or academia.edu, and they're still not assigning their students to do anything online. You see kind of there's this, um, there's this uh, quantum step that needs to be taken. Now, in 1997, I was involved in a project where we looked at how students were being assessed in relation to communication skills, uh, presentation or participation, teamwork and facilitation, writing in professional formats, addressing the public or media, creating multimedia, writing an essay, or doing some other form of assessment. We left out exams because that wasn't interesting. We didn't see students building their communication skills in exams unless they were cheating. Uh, we looked at roughly 700 subject outlines. About 70% of the subject outlines used in that semester at that university. And in the Faculty of Science, which is our baseline, these are the, these are the percentage of subjects that said in the subject outline they were assessing these areas. So writing a lab report would count as writing in a professional format or writing a, a research report or consultancy report. So you see over in the one, two, three, four, fifth column, creating multimedia, consider that to be zero. Nobody was assessing students on how to create multimedia in 1997. So if we look at that, what's happening today, I don't know what the statistics are today. We'd have to guess at that. And so that's, you know, you could have a discussion just on that. What are we assigning students to do? And you could have another discussion about what should we be doing? Should we be having 60% of students creating something to multimedia given the large role it plays in their lives? 
should we be having a larger fraction of students doing teamwork? So I'm sensing, given the amount of work that we academics do in, in this, you know, with information and communication technology and how little we ask students to submit that exploit that medium, there may be a, a threshold concept involved, which Meyer and Land have defined as a, a powerful concept. And these are the criteria they use to list it. It's troublesome. It's transformative. Once you gain an understanding of that concept, you don't go back. It's irreversible. You see things in a different way. It's integrated, bounded, discursively constituted. When we look up uh, their articles for a, a description of these criteria, but my sense is there's, it's, it's almost a no-brainer that we should be assigning students to do these things but we're not. So, so what is it in the mindset of individual lecturers that's, that's stopping them? Examples of threshold concepts, if you're not familiar, would be in economics. And in areas related to science, it's, they're seen as specific concepts or ideas, like an economic opportunity cost, or in statistics, the notion of a confidence interval. In the arts, it's seen more as a perspective or more an affective thing, such as in education, the appreciation of how to respect themselves and others, a little more nebulous. So is it a threshold concept here, a particular idea, or is it uh, a perspective, realizing how important uh, students' abilities in new media are? So to examine that, we had a professional research interviewer I uh, interview roughly 20 scientists, academic scientists, interviews ranging from 15 to 90 minutes. Um, as I alluded to before, their use of ICTs in administration, teaching, and research, and exploring that for themes. Some of the quotes we had emerging from those interviews were, uh, it's uh, more of a cultural change than a technological one. Some people like media, others not so much. I need extra time to investigate, or scientists do not participate in online discussions. So in looking at these kinds of responses and thinking about this arena and the reactions we've seen over the last two years, there's a sense that particularly in science where communication can be a problematic area, there's an overlap between perceptions of communication generally, perceptions and attitudes toward teaching, and perceptions and attitudes toward ICTs in the web. So there's some kind of overlap there. So these responses are telling us also about how lecturers feel about teaching as well as how scientists feel about communication in general. And so this is just reiterating that point. What are the, what's their orientation toward technology, toward teaching? And, and when it comes to communication, toward audiences who are not other scientists, who are not simply students. Before I go ahead, what comments or questions do you have at this point? Jackie's got okay, and Jackie, if you'd like to take the microphone, uh, I'll uh, put hang my microphone up, and you should be able to take it by pressing the talk button. Jackie, if you're having problems with your microphone, what you might want to do is just uh, type in uh, instead, because it looks like we're not hearing anything. Uh, if you are pressing the button and saying anything, uh, we certainly can't hear that. So perhaps, uh, Will, do you want to yep. keep going? And we'll just okay. see. I'll put you Okay, so one of the key issues that seems to have emerged from some of our conversations and in our interviews has to do with the power relationship between the lecturer and the student and how much power one gives to the student. Is that notion of technical mastery is um, if, the t if the lecturer hasn't mastered a particular area like how to make a video, is it fair for them to ask their students to do that? Or if you don't know what technical mastery the students have, is it fair to ask a classroom of students to all make a podcast? 
you know, there's the tradition of the lecturer knows more than the student, the lecturer should be able to assist the student. So do you need to be able to assist the student or will the student's questions, can you direct them to others in the class or can you direct them to look at things, uh, look up insights on the web or guidance on how to make a podcast or how to upload something to YouTube or, or how you do a storyboard for a video. Yes, crowdsourcing support and issues, exactly. And also that notion of students creating something where they're voicing it for an audience beyond the classroom. Uh, the issue is, isn't that traditionally the job of people who are professionals? Why would you have a student who hasn't finished their training dealing with people explaining science or explaining some other discipline for an outside audience? And related to that is the opportunity for students to, to make mistakes in public. And one of the one of the chief uh, knee jerk reactions is they see something like that on um, animation about global warming and geoengineering, and they say the students depicted carbon dioxide as a brown gas. It's not brown. What if students walk away thinking carbon dioxide is brown? And the notion is it's important for students to to voice their misconceptions so that they can be addressed. And perhaps what you should do is let students know that the, some of the information their classmates are presenting may not be correct. There's a lot of uh, discussion going on in the chat space. Uh, going on to yeah, Jack, uh, to read. Yeah, Jackie's made an interesting point there. And I just wanted okay, to, want to respond to that one. Okay, we thought that scientists don't participate in online discussions. Change is the same for students. I had a discussion with a math teacher today who also said math students don't think you can talk about math. Well, this would be an interesting topic to explore. I think there are scientists who participate in online discussions, but the question is with whom? And and for students not realizing you can talk about math, it is an interesting pushback from a lecturer, but the question is, well, does that mean they shouldn't? And perhaps the perceptions of math and in, in the outside world among math, among people who don't like mathematics may shift if we seem to be a topic of conversation. Continuing okay, a public forum for student work adds to the authenticity of task, also adds to the stakes with students producing higher quality work and then dealing with their national students. It's a, in our experience, some students feel too exposed, especially those from countries with more restrictive regimes. Yes, I had some students who were learning English uh, where I did a workshop with them where they were to create a one minute uh, podcast or video where they were explaining a scientific concept in English. And they, had, they were engineering students from Kyoto University who had come to Sydney. And uh, they really got into it. There is that issue of feeling my broken English will be criticized. The issue of uh, censorship is also important. Uh, there were students at United Arab Emirates University, women who were studying chemistry. We did a video conference, including the heads of the chemistry professional societies in the UK and Canada and the US, and they videotaped this. And uh, I linked to their videotape on YouTube. And, uh, and a week later, the lecturer was told by the parents that uh, they had not been asked permission, and so the videotape had to be taken down. So it introduces, yeah, all sorts of issues about um, who's willing to be seen in public, who's comfortable to be seen in public. But the nice thing about is that in some forums, things can be made semi-private. Like in YouTube, students can select some for their video to be semi-private, so they get a URL and they can send that to the lecturer and other students, but nobody can find it by searching on YouTube. It's uh, an interim measure. I still think there's a uh, forum needs to be developed where student stuff can, can be in a semi-public student space where the students aren't up against copyright issues and some of these privacy and sensitivity issues can be dealt with. Yes, as, as Brent had said, only those with the link can view it. And so the notion is, you know, perhaps we need, you know, the current, we, those of us who are really interested can find workarounds. We can find a way for students to view things in semi-private spaces. But what I would imagine within five or ten years, we need a platform for student-generated multimedia content for it to become a more normal part 
of university teaching. So we remove the, the actual logistical barriers and some of the ethical concerns, and then we're only up against the mindsets of our, of our colleagues. Yes, bandwidth issues. Okay. So examples of student-generated multimedia, con uh, multimedia content. Uh, these, we came up with six categories. Traditional assignments, where they're dialed down in new media, where they could have been done on paper. Colleague, uh, colleagues at University of Western Australia and first-year chemistry students in a service subject create podcasts on acids and bases and oxidation and reduction reactions to make sure they understood these concepts that had been a bit problematic in the past. And the students showed some real creativity, some very good examples there. Second kind of assignment, documenting a process, such as you might do in a lab report. A colleague at the University of New South Wales had students making wikis on laboratory techniques and cell biology. So they were finding information on the web and accumulating that in a central place. And because they were the authors, the notion was they were getting more engaged with the content. The third thing would be commenting. Uh, for example, uh, students creating videos on an issue in environmental biology, as in the University of Queensland class, first year biology class. They're commenting on something going on in the public sphere. Um, peer assessment, the students who made podcasts used an online quiz as a format in which to assess their teammates. You know, so they had the names of them, enter the names of their four teammates and then assess them in various qualities of their contribution to the team project. So using something on the learning management system, but using it in a creative way to assess classmates instead of just regurgitating information. Fifth, uh, reporting. Uh, instead of a lab notebook, maybe make it an open lab notebook so various people can see the information you're gathering and your, your perceptions on it as it's being developed instead of in a, a final book that only the lecturer looks at. And then providing information for a public or a lay audience. A colleague at the University of South Australia has students make animations on topics related to health literacy and has the students test them on a lay person to see whether the lay person can understand the concept. And this is just in science. So the rationale that the lecturers are telling us they're using is to get students engaged with the content. Um, a lot of, I'd say perhaps half of the examples we found were done in service subjects where they chemistry for nursing students. There was a fear that they would lose the students. They said they'll have them do something creative, they'll invest them. Authenticity, to give students an audience beyond the instructor to make it more like a real world assignment. And that relates to the engagement as well as to the depth of learning. In addition, the people who did this were just good teachers. They were people who, you talking to them, you got a sense they cared about the learning process. And they do what I call situated evaluation. They could see that it was working through various aspects of the quality of the work done. But the challenge now is how can you actually gauge the deep learning that's occurring? Some of the issues they were wrestling with is, did they give individual students an assignment and give them, you know, five pages of how to make a video, or do they count on the abilities within a team of students that if you say make a video, that's all you have to say, that they'll go out and they'll find on the web or from somebody's friend how to assemble one, and maybe give them some guidelines on, you know, how long it should be focusing on the content or get carried away with special effects. Okay, I've used, so Tina's saying I've used videoing, performing practical skills for assessment. Students have complained that they spent more time trying to video, edit, upload than actually learning and performing the skill. Have you experienced this before? Any advice? Uh, yes, it can be very time consuming. Uh, one, one of the approaches you can use is have students do something for practice. And so they make their mistakes on like a 30 second piece introducing themselves. They can do a piece to camera, you know, that's maybe uh, I have students do a video resume for forming into teams saying, well, these are my skills that I think would be useful in the team. And, uh, and that can get over a little bit of the technical overhead. Having them work in teams so somebody knows how to do this without too much trouble. Having them upload to YouTube because YouTube gives them really good instructions. And then you as an instructor get everything in the same format is absolutely essential. 
the editing is something that they will complain. If it's their first video assignment, they'll, they'll have underestimated and not have been too ambitious. Another approach is have them do a storyboard. So every shot they're going to make, they have to do a drawing of what's going to be included and severely limiting the length and telling them, you know, it's going to take you five times as long to edit as you're going to end up showing me, or 10 times as long, or 20 times as long. Another approach is to use slow motion, which is an animation pro approach where you have the students make the animation at two frames per second rather than 10 frames per second. So it's more like an animated PowerPoint where you can do voiceover. And it takes some of the load off actually doing a video. And the other is just have them do a PowerPoint slideshow, but with audio attached to it, which is something you can do through PowerPoint. Because I think you really want them to focus on scripting and getting their message right and to worry less about sound quality. And that's the traditional downfall when students make videos is really bad sound quality. So I went through those kind of quickly. Uh, if you go to our website, our wiki, at the end there will be some more tips about uh, how to get students over that hump. But yes, the, for the next few years, if you assign students to make a video, they will complain about how much time it takes. One of the ways that lecturers um, Yes, okay. How do you equate assignment length uh, to word count? Uh, well, one of the things the lecturers are doing is they're hedging and not giving a very large percentage of the mark to the multimedia assignment. Uh, if, let me see. I guess it's thinking about how many hours does the student put into the assignment. And thinking about, you can think about the script and figure a person speaks about, what is it, seven to ten sentences per minute about 12 words per sentence, so about 100 words per minute. And then that tells you a five-minute video would be 500 words, except they're going to have to write 5,000 to make it a good, you know, short video. So you can do your scaling in that way. So what you're getting is you're getting, and that's the thing with multimedia, you're getting something that's very information rich in a way that words alone are not. So you, you'd cut back on, on how much you would be asking for if you just looked at the script. But yes, getting our, um, uh, what do they call that? Because I've forgotten all my science. A, a factor you multiply something by to change the units? Yes, we need a conversion factor. So yes, we need a conversion factor. Okay. So keeping the marks light the first time you do it, don't make it an 80% assignment. Make it like 10%. Um, the marking rubric should focus on content, you know, and you know, focus on what, what are the concepts you want them to be understanding and conveying, and, but also leave some room to give them some marks for artistry. And hopefully you have enough um, leeway that you have a way, if it's a team assignment, if somebody doesn't perform on the team, there's some way of making up those marks. And you're giving students credit for experimenting in a new format. So the hope is your colleagues aren't looking over your shoulder when you do this. I remember there was a TV chef who uh, was putting some chicken into a pot. She dropped a piece of chicken on the floor. She then picked up the piece of chicken, threw it back on the pot, into the pot, threw it into the pot, turned to the camera and said, remember, you're alone in the kitchen. So it's, it's important to kind of cloak what you're doing from your colleagues and do it at a pilot scale first and make some mistakes. And then after you've done that, after you see the, some of the great student output, then you show it to your colleagues. So the other issue is the one we discussed earlier, how do you keep the student's content semi-private? And again, YouTube or Vimeo is a good way of doing that. You find the site, students upload it, and they send you the URL. So that's science. Uh, my sense is the media disciplines are ahead in using multimedia, but in the arts they tend to particularly uh, digital media disciplines. Students have been making websites for years. Uh, in the arts, uh, what I'm hearing from um, Matthew Allen at Curtin University is the arts work on the web tends to be, you know, wikis, blogs, and discussion, mainly text-based, except maybe, you know, in the fine arts area. And so the notion is get it, once you put the visual element in and you get away from words, things tend to get very complicated and people are a little more hesitant to move ahead. And also the notion is to use that all learning principles. Um, uh, Oh, either in the nature of your assignment, 
is what I'm referring to here with these with these examples in terms of the content of the assignment or in terms of having students reflect on the assignment. A colleague of mine uh, in a first year science subject in graduate attributes has had students keep online reflective journals. But getting a first year science students to be reflective is a big ask. So we started each of the um, journal entries with some tick boxes. How are you feeling about university? Good, okay, kind of alienated. And now say something about why you feel that way. A colleague at Charles Sturt University has had students working on wikis, creating wikis together, a shared website, um, doing case studies in forensic science. That included mature age students, police officers at a distance, along with traditional undergraduates on campus. So, so there are ways of being creative with these media and thinking of the students as adults rather than as, you know, children giving something to their parents. It relates to Eric Burns' ego states and says so very much a shift in, um, shift in where the responsibility lies and, and that can be demanding for a lecture as well. So the challenges in experimenting ourselves or getting colleagues to experiment are, are, are what we're hearing from our colleagues' reasons or excuses. You know, is the marking of the assignment defensible? You know, my sense is you could have the same criticism of multiple choice exams. Who chooses what the questions are about? You know, who says what's important and what isn't important? If a student gets something wrong on a final exam that's multiple choice, do they ever know what they've gotten wrong? Is there ever any discussion on that? Um, questions about deeper learning. How can you assess the deeper learning if students are engaging in deeper learning? And that's from the lecturers who are actually engaging in this. They sense it's there. Where can we get the evidence of that, convincing evidence of that? And as the comment that came up earlier, the time of the students, they're doing something they haven't done before. But my sense is, given that all the students in year nine and 10 are, have netbooks, uh, and they all have phones, you know, cameras in their phones, I think in the next 10 years, students are going to become more and more accustomed to at least recording video. But making it a convincing composition is something that we'll still have to work with them with. Um, and that's why I said, you know, old skill, new media. Because I think it's that notion of composition carries through. And now the challenge is how do we, you know, if we can get students really engaged in this trendy new media stuff, how do we bring through those old fashioned ideas about catering to your audience, getting feedback to see if things work, figuring out, uh, you know, explaining things clearly, being sure of the information we're providing, providing useful uh, peer input for our classmates and our colleagues. So other reasons and excuses, copyright's a big one. And uh, until there's a, a .edu uh, zone on the web where nobody worries about copyright, we're still up against having students' work first, first shared within the classroom and then shared to only behind a, a login. Otherwise, there will be copyright violations through background music images, that sort of thing. What if there are errors in content? And again, something not traditional in some areas like science, and science one answer is correct. How do we deal with that? And how do we have students discussing their perceptions and creating a dialogue about what's correct, what isn't correct, how can things be improved? The big issue is approval of colleagues. People are very worried, uh, you know, it's bad enough to be somebody who focuses on teaching in a, in a discipline or a, and in a university system with uh, focusing more and more on research and now to be doing something that's beyond the pale, you know, having students creating things on their computers that aren't just text, that bring, may bring you under scrutiny. One student had, one student, one lecturer at Griffith in science had her students make videos about particularly challenging topics where the students had problems in the past and the students apparently worked brilliantly and along with some other changes in the class, students got very high marks and came under scrutiny from colleagues who didn't believe it. So we're still in that proving ground stage. All right, thank you for participating, Clarence. I, sorry, you have to go. And then if you're not able to create multimedia, how can you teach it? And I think uh, some of us are living proof that you can ask students to do things that, that you don't need to do, but to do it on a trial basis. So now I'm wondering, what do you think? 
would, what would your colleagues think? What would your students think? What would employers, the dean or the associate dean for teaching and learning? So just saying, want to check the Australian Quality Framework learning outcomes, whether the assessment was of appropriate standard. Deb saying, if I'm more resistance from academics than students, I agree with that. I like the idea of secret pilots and presenting great examples. I agree, more resistance from academics than students. Yeah. The STE also provides some excellent rubric criteria and learning outcomes. Yeah, that'd be great if you could, um, Brent, if you could email me uh, a URL for that. We'll put it on our wiki. It's academics feel time poor, and some faculty have set workload allocation for marking, so only a certain number of hours for assessment. The peer assessment can get around that. Okay, so using this to decrease the casual teaching budget. Uh, as soon as you go to online students complain and request more face-to-face -face time, happy medium. I think the notion is that is in face-to-face -face time, um, yes, it's attention and uh, there's a certain and reassurance, and there may be other ways of doing that. You know, very hard to be creative when assessments are set across six campuses. Yes, the AQF requires communication skills. Why not online? And that's, yeah, and I'd say this sort of online stuff should become the next graduate attribute, or, or be incorporated into the current one. Okay, we're just, just getting to my tips. Yes, pilot have student teams of varied abilities constrain student ambition, scaffold, you're giving them a major assignment. It may not be major in terms of marks, but it'll be major in terms of anxiety. And then put them through peer review to lighten the marking load, and, this, and students love seeing each other's works. And you develop their editing ability if they do peer review. And there's our URL for our project wiki. And as I said, you have anything interesting to add, email it to me and uh, or to whatever web whatever email address I put on the wiki and and we'll add it okay, okay thanks very much will for that that was excellent and you can see from the conversations that have been generated uh, in our chat uh, that there's, there's been a lot of interest obviously in the area that you've been discussing uh, we'll obviously we'll stay on uh, and obviously people can continue to ask questions or continue to to talk but I know some people may have to go uh, so that's fine so I just wanted to say formal thank you Will uh, thank you also to Doing Assessment Scotland for allowing us to be part of their uh, program during these uh, during these sessions uh, so that's been great thanks to all those uh, people from around the world who will be on today I think uh, Matthew's just put up the URL for the um, for the survey. So if you wouldn't, if you are going to head off, uh, if you wouldn't mind filling out the survey before you uh, run off, and then of course you can ask more questions. So you can either type those in, 
or you can put your hand up. Remember, you can, if you want to take the microphone, just put your hand up like that, and your number will appear beside your uh, name, and we'll hand the mic over to you. Okay. Will Jessica have a comment? No? Absolutely. Was there anyone who wanted to take the microphone there? Okay, so Tina asks, uh, repeat the site details. I go through for more tips on regarding videos. Um, I would say go to our wiki, and we'll have links from our project wiki. Any other questions from our participants? No, I didn't say anything about SAMNAT. <laughs> yes, there's, there's, um, we have a grant, uh, colleagues at University of Sydney and, and other universities have a grant to improve science lecturing at Australian universities by finding the lecturers who teach well and are innovative and creative and build their leadership capacity so they can be more influential with their colleagues and with their head of school and with their dean and with their deputy vice chancellor and vice chancellor. So it's leadership development and development of intellectual leadership through the scholarship of teaching and learning and we're uh, picking up on networks that are already there and those that are being funded in parallel. And it's a uh, yeah, very interesting arena now in Australia in this particular domain. So if you go to www.samnet.edu.au, you can find out more about it. Would you like to press the talk button on the microphone? Sorry, Jackie, if you were pressing that, we could see you were pressing it, but we certainly couldn't hear anything. Um, so sorry about that. I'm not sure whether the problem is at your end with your uh, microphone, uh, but certainly we could see you were trying to, uh, so you, perhaps you better just uh, type in. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, I'll put in the URL. Uh, actually, Matthew, do you want to just put in the URL to the OLT site? Uh, sorry, Jeff, I'm not quite sure which site you mean. Um, does the ALT site still there, or has it disappeared now that it's become OLT? 
saw all of them. What Jackie was referring to was the Office for Learning and Teaching, which is the uh, new version of the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. Uh, so if those of you who have uh, bookmarked your ALTC uh, website, that should just redirect you to the new Office for Learning and Teaching website, and I've actually put up the URL there. So that's where you find lots of resources from all of the projects, fellowships, uh, activities that um, various people in, in Australia have been involved in in terms of uh, learning and teaching in the tertiary sector. Uh, so those of you who know about the ALTC, the Australian Learning and Teaching Council, that is continuing and it's continuing just under the new name if uh, people haven't caught up with that. I think probably most people have, um, have finished and gone on now. So um, maybe what we'll do is, sorry, just say a final thank you very much. Was there any last things you wanted to say, Will? Well, no, just thank you to everybody for participating. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing a lot more student assignments on the web. Yes, hopefully. And yeah, hopefully we will see that. All right, Jackie, thanks very much. Sorry you had a few problems with the uh, microphone there. Not quite sure what was happening there. But anyway, it's good that we can text in.